Hi, Church Times readers. Um, I'm joined today by Rachel Mann, who is here to talk about her book, um, In the Bleak Midwinter Through Christmas and Advent with Christina Rossetti. Um, so Rachel, many of our readers will be familiar with Christina Rossetti, um, but for those who aren't, could you perhaps introduce her to us um, and maybe say a bit about why you like her and her poetry so okay. much? Okay. Christina Rossetti, 19th century, part of a very prominent Anglo-Italian family, uh, probably known to most people because of her connection with the pre-Raphaelite movement, which is that tremendous art movement of the 19th century, mm -hmm. has a very famous brother, Dante Gabriel. I think he overshadows her <laughs> far too much. Um, and crucially for this book, um, a really, she was a really, really prominent Anglo-Catholic mm. at a time when Anglo-Catholicism, the Oxford movement, as it's often known, mm. Tractarianism, was beginning to emerge. Now, I suppose my interest extends back a long time, partly because, of course, she, her words um, are usually known as a Christmas carol, um, but commonly known as In the Bleak Midwinter, mm. It is possibly our greatest Christmas carol. But um, I had the great good fortune of writing a PhD about her and Elizabeth Barrett Browning and the Bible and how they mm. use biblical images. So that's really the heart of my passion. Um, great. In, in the book, you talk about how running through her poetry is Anglo-Catholicism. I think you mentioned Keeble. Um, yeah. Can you say how that kind of manifests itself in the poetry, reading it? How, how could you um, identify that that influenced her? Well, partly it's the seriousness with which she takes, um, I suppose, some of those um, concepts, ideas, um, uh, doctrinal matters, which would have been considered rather fruity, I suppose, in the 19th century. Her seriousness about, uh, about Mary, crucially about the sacrament mm. and how serious the sacrament is to be taken. And without getting too technical about it, I'm one of those people who believes that she took Keeble's doctrine of reserve very seriously. The doctrine of reserve, the idea that, mm. that poetry is a very particular gift from God in order to encounter God. Mm. And um, she, she, she has had a, a copy of Keeble's A Christian Year, which was hugely and heavily annotated. Um, her brother William Michael said she didn't really rate Keeble, but I think that's that's a wrong reading. Mm. Um, the thing that she really takes from Keeble is the recovery of the Christian year as significant for our identity as Christians. And this is why mm. Advent and Christmas particularly yeah. um, is really important. Great. So in the book um, you write, it is possible to be sneery about Victorian women's poetry of devotion. Um, so how perhaps has she been unfairly depicted? How would she be kind of a cartoonish description of her? What would that look like? Yeah, um, she, like a number of Victorian women poets who, let's be clear, in their day mm. had quite high reputations. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was up for Poet Laureate. Mm but nonetheless have tended to be read by, I think, quite a sneery male academic establishment as um, writing all about the heart <laughs> and it all being rather gloopy and sentimental. And there was a period, with, particularly with Rossetti, when she was seen as representing this, this quiet inner world of faith. Mm. And her poetry treated too much as as in almost fantastical fairy tale mode um, and of course she wrote a lot for children mm -hmm. that's fair enough but I think that one of the things that's happened since the 1970s particularly through the work of feminist scholars is to discover that there is grit and power and it, an incredibly ambitious theology mm. embedded in her work. Great. Um, you also write that there's been a tendency to see Faith as an embarrassing adjunct to her poetical talent. And why do you think that came about and are we seeing a shift, um, a shift in academia? That's a great question. Um, I think that um, 
we always have to accept that there are going to be fashions in um, the, the, the poetic world, in the academic world. Mm -hmm. And it's fair to say that those people who did the real serious work of recovering Rossetti's poetry mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s, for the most part, came from quite a secular perspective mm. and I you know hands up here the 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 book begins with a, a section from Goblin Market which mm. is um, absolutely Rossetti's most famous and arguably greatest poem and that has been seen as as a very much a, a non-religious poem by by many people mm. but of course once people start to look at closely at that magnificent poem, they, they notice that it has this incredible account of the Eucharist in there, of, mm. of one of the sisters acting as a Jesus figure. And I think that, that that has led over time to academics starting to say, hold on a second, we've recovered her so-called secular poetry. What about these hundreds of other poems, what do they say? Mm. And of course, most of the poetry is religious. Mm. And, and particularly from the States, there's been a growing confidence to say, come on, you can't just simply treat Rossetti as a poet who wrote one or two absolutely major poems. Let's look at her, her whole oeuvre, as it were, mm. and start to to take seriously the faith dimension. Mm. So I think there's, there's been growing confidence, and certainly since the turn of the millennium, um, there have been a lot of people who've started to write about the way in which her Christianity intersects with her feminism, intersects with her poetry. Because mm. um, you also write in the book that she wasn't in any modern sense a feminist. Um, so what did you mean when, when you wrote that? Well. <sighs> I think it's just being honest that um, she sent very mixed messages about mm. the status of women, that um, she was not hugely critical of women's role and status in the church, at least as I read it. Mm. Um, nonetheless, I mean, it's worth saying that, that, of course, she was involved in that movement to recover the religious life mm. and therefore was involved in working with what would then have been called fallen women, mm. um, had a sister who became re a religious. Um, so I think it's just acknowledging this tension that, that the one thing that, that, that I don't think we should go looking for in her poetry is the kind of politics that I, I think is much clearer in Elizabeth Barrett Brown, Browning's poetry. Mm. There was a sense in which she wanted to take seriously the deposit of faith um, as um, had been found in Anglicanism up to that time. But like so many middle class women, was also doing something very subversive in finding the wriggle room. Mm. You know, these, these were women who particularly for middle-class women who weren't expected to work. Mm. Work was seen as a kind of symptom of fallenness. Mm. So what did they do? They started to be subversive in their private lives, in, the, in, in so-called women's work, in the, the way in which they, they created poetry. But also in terms of saying, oh, so there's these new religious movements emerging through Anglo-Catholicism. Well, okay, that means we can go out into the world and start serving in a different way. Mm. And, you know, that's one of the things that, I mean, I, 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 they, they would say never mess with a nun, you know, and you just, <laughs> you know, not, I mean, I, you know, some of my best friends are nuns and they are fierce people and they know how to be subversive, how to be feminist, but not in the kind of votes for women sense. Mm. I think we've all been uh, challenged by none at General Synod <laughs> over the years. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Um, you also write, I was really interested in this quote, um, Rossetti is only able to offer religious poetry of such demanding richness because she understands the depths of our desire and the sensuality of the body. Um, I think partly because it um, reminded me a bit of things that people say about John Donne, for example, yeah. combining the two. Um, could you say a bit more about that? Well, I think part of what's going on here is um, 
biography and I'm always cautious about reading too much biography into someone's poetry. Mm. But let's be clear here, Christina understood what it was to um, experience pain. You know, she she suffered through her life, through a variety mm. of illnesses. And I think that she understood that. She also understood what it was to perhaps have the promise of, of marriage and then that not happen. Mm. But where I think we see it most clearly is in this tension that we find between the ravishing poetry of something like Goblin Market, where we have these lists of extraordinary fruits and it's so mouth-watering and amazing. And she understands how that is a bodily matter, about the way in which the world is full of treats and temptations and fruits, some forbidden, some not. But she doesn't just dismiss it. Mm. She kind of sublimates that, reworks that through this very astringent poetry. And I mean, to talk very briefly about the, the most famous poem, let's call it In the Bleak Midwinter, mm. it's, it's so tense, it's so tough. And the, she's talking about, you know, in the bleak, bleak midwinter long ago, and, and there's this uh, uh, frost and snow on snow, and it's sharp and it's harsh, and yet into that world comes the mm. babe and and there's the Virgin Mary sharing this moment of intimacy mm. with God. Mm. And and that's so brilliantly done. And 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 like John Donne, who in one sense was a profoundly worldly poet. Mm. Um, I think that in both their cases, both Dunn and Rossetti, it's because of their comprehension of the realities, the facts of the world, mm. that they can take us into such transcendence. Mm. Um, one of the themes um, in the book is Rossetti's understanding of God's time. Yes. And you talk a lot about how um, we can relate that to um, Advent and to waiting and the promise that, that comes with that. Um, can you say a bit more about what her understanding of, of God's time was? OK, well, it, can I put that in the context of what we might call um, non-godly time? I'm not going to call it ungodly because I don't mm -hmm. want to dismiss it. But living in a world as we do and actually as middle class Victorians did as well, where... Mm. Uh, waiting is is not really fashionable, let's be clear here, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and particularly the way we understand Advent, it's all about giving giving oneself a treat, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. you have a gin Advent calendar, <laughs> each day have a bottle of gin, and it's great fun, but there's no sense of waiting. It's a very secular understanding of time, and I, I call it in the book commercial time, the mm. idea that we sort of measure things by what we can buy. Mm. What Rossetti is brilliant at, and it's partly, again, it's the influence, I think, of Keeble, is saying, no, there are different understandings of time. Time can be constructed and shaped differently. And we see this particularly in, in Rossetti's skillful ability to write poems for seasons mm. and she's very clear that the starting point for us as Christians is not it's not January the first um, you know or it's it's um, it's not shaped around um, going to the shops and what time does the shop what do the shops open and what time can I get there mm. it begins on Advent Sunday mm. And that that time is one which looks forward to the new heaven, the new earth. Mm. I want and in see... which you can live in right here and now. And mm. that's an incredible understanding of time. I was just going to um, draw on that, actually, because you um, quote her line, the end of all things is at hand. And I was thinking that could sound um, a bit alarming. And perhaps we sometimes kind of shy away from the apocalyptic imagery in the Bible. Um, so what do you think she was talking about there when, when she used that? Was she talking about the second coming, the, the end of all things? I, 
I do. I mean, I, th I, I always want a both and, but that probably doesn't surprise you. Um, I think that, that part of the seriousness of her faith meant that she was being expectant. Mm. She absolutely wants her readers to dare to live in that expectation, not necessarily in an alarming way, but in a sense of, of the world coming to fulfilment. Mm. So I think there's that, absolutely. And I mean, let's be clear, there is something a little alarming for us about that. And mm. um, her, her commentary um, on Revelation, Book of Revelation in the Face of the Deep, is, is a really serious wrestling with that. Mm. But I also think it's about sharpening. I think that what we find find in her, her her poetry is that she, you know, she is not a fanatic in the kind of American fundamentalist, rather parodic way, mm. which actually very few people I think really believe. But you know that mm. that she's not that sort of apocalyptician. That's a good word. <laughs> I didn't think I could say that. Um, it's about sharpening our attention mm. because not only is the kingdom of God, which is represents perhaps the end of, of this time at hand, but Christmas is at hand. Mm. So it's about preparation mm. and being sharp and focused. And I think if we can dare to take this sense of, of the world being on the precipice, on the edge, seriously, I think we're better ready to encounter the joy of Christmas. Mm, perfect. Um, one of the things I liked about the book, um, and perhaps this is um, how some people might sort of remember learning poetry at school, um, is you say that it was sort of encouraged to see a poem as a puzzle that we need to unlock. And you're encouraging us um, with this book to take a different approach where you say we're invited into mystery. Um, and perhaps some people won't have really read poetry since they were at school and do have those connotations of, I just need to sort of unlock this riddle. Um, so what, what kind of approach would you like us to take? How does being invited into mystery work? Well, I think one of the, the ideas that I use in the book is, um, I suppose a prayer idea, a prayerful idea. Um, mm. There is that ancient way of reading called Lexio or Lectio Divina, mm. which is slow reading and allowing images and ideas to unfold, to read and reread and go mm. back again and slow down, which, I mean, heavens in December, goodness me, don't we all need a bit more of that? But I think that's one of the ways in which we participate in mystery. Now, clearly, when we do that with a Bible passage, there is a sense in which we are doing something slightly different than what we might do with one of Rossetti's poetry, big poems rather, because the Bible has a different status for us as people mm. of faith. But that approach, that technique, means that instead of us going, ooh, what does this mean? Um, how can I find the puzzle and the clue which then will make this, in a sense, very simple and straightforward, mm. that, that becomes less of an issue and rather we, we dare, and this is, um, oh, this is a naughty idea in Advent, we dare to allow ourselves to be ravished by the mm. poetry. And you know, I don't think that's such a terrible thing, even when we're reading the Bible, because God desires us. God is, is a desiring God mm. and wants to call us into relationship. And to be ravished by love, oh my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry, I get a bit excited about this. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very John Donne as well. Yes. Um, just um, finally, sir, I think many um, readers might be familiar with In the Bleak with Winter, um, but are there particular poems or a poem that you're excited about people maybe discovering through this book, which they might not be familiar with? Oh my goodness, <laughs> that is a really tricky question. Um, I think that there might be some surprises in store for people when they read the poem. There are two, two, three, maybe three poems actually um, that reflect on the Holy Innocents. Mm. 
They might be really surprised by the uh, poems for the Feast of St. John. Um, and what you see Rossetti doing in both those cases um, is taking familiar stories and offering her slightly skew with take on them. I suppose the, 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 one, the, the one poem which I mean, I adore and I think will make some people potentially a little bit uncomfortable. They think, why is this in here? But I mm. absolutely earns its place is Winter My Secret. Mm. Winter My Secret seems, well, I, I mean, I guess, it, let's be honest, it is a secular poem reflecting on winter. Mm. But what it offers is, and having talked about puzzles and not being interested in them, it actually offers us a key to... Rossetti's wider understanding of poetry because it's so mysterious, it's so elusive, it is so astringent and every time one reads it one thinks I'm, now I'm going to understand it and actually it, it, it resists and holds back meaning and yet reveals new things. Mm. So I, I hope people love their encounter with Winter My Secret. Thank you so much for your time, Rachel. Um, and In the Bleak Midwinter through Advent and Christmas with Christina Rossetti will be available from Canterbury Press at the Church House Bookshop and other retailers.